All right, we're back. I left you in suspense last time, didn't I? We were trying to figure out what the charge would be when iron forms an ion. We said it most likely would not be negative 10 and it wouldn't be positive 8. So what do we do with transition metals? Well, let me give you two rules. Two rules can be used to determine the charge on a transition or inner transition ion. Rule number one is the first one we use. Electrons, obviously. Electrons in the highest energy level are lost first, and they lose those both at the same time. You'll see what I mean in just a second. Now, when I say the highest energy level, this doesn't necessarily mean the electrons that entered the atom last. For instance, as we saw with iron, or as we will see here in just a second, the highest energy level is the fourth energy level not the third. So we're talking about these guys here, the ones that entered the, uh, the ones that have the highest energy level, not the ones that entered the atom last. So they'll lose those um, both right at the same time. Then rule number two, a D and F sublevel turn out to be quite stable when they are half full. That means each orbital has one electron in it. Now it may lose additional electrons one at a time until it reaches this stable state. I'm also going to add one other thing to, to rule number two. A DNF a sublevel are also stable when they are full. That means that these sublevel has 10 electrons in it and an F would have 14. Turns out to give them some stability. Okay, so let's take a look at iron again and figure out some possible charges for it. Um, let's do the let's do the orbital diagram for the last few electrons in iron. Remember, it ended with four s two, and then three d. It was three d six, wasn't it? So one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's the orbital diagram for iron. Now, they'll lose the highest energy level electrons first. Boom, we'll lose those both at the same time. So one possible charge of iron would be two plus. And then we'll use the second rule. A D sublevel turns out to be stable when it's half full. This is not half full, it's one away from being half full. So it can lose that guy, boom, after it's lost these first two, and then iron will have lost a total of three so it could also be 3 plus. So the possible charges for iron we would expect to see would be 2 positive or 3 positive. By the way, chemists sometimes like to say 2 positive as opposed to positive 2 or 3 positive as opposed to positive 3. Uh, it means the same thing. What about nickel? Let's take a look at nickel. That's another transition metal. It's way over here. Okay, so it's electron configuration. Let's see, it's argon, 4s2, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so let's write that down. Uh, the configuration is argon, 4s2, 3D, 8. Okay, let's do an orbital diagram for the last electrons to enter. The 4s has a pair in it, and my 3D has 8 electrons in it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6, 7, and 8. So let's figure out the possible charges for nickel. We know it's going to lose those two right away, right? Rule number one. So one charge we would expect to see for nickel would be two positive. Then it can lose the D sublevel electrons as it's set up here, one at a time. So it can lose additional electrons one at a time until it reaches that stable half full configuration. So if it loses this one, in addition to those two it already lost, it could be 3 plus, then it could lose that one, so we'd expect to see 4 plus, and then that one, so we'd expect to see 5 plus. So 2, 3, 4, and 5 plus. This is the highest energy level right away, and then the D's one at a time until it's half full. Okay? Let's take a look at zinc. Zinc is argon 4s2 3d10. So its orbital diagram would be 4s with a pair in it, and the 3d would have 10 electrons in it. So let's draw those in. Okay, so we'd expect to lose those two. So we'd expect to see 2 plus for zinc. 
And then what about the D sub level? Remember we said about the D sub level. It's particularly stable when it's full, which zinc is, or half full. So it's not going to lose any others. Zinc we would expect to be two positive only. And that's the case. So on my periodic table by zinc, just to help me remember that it's only going to be two positive, I'm going to put two positive right there by zinc. Now cadmium is in the same family as zinc, so we'd expect to see the same thing. Unfortunately, we can't do the same for mercury. Things tend to fall apart as we go down the periodic table because the radius becomes so large, there's so many sublevels, and there's so much shielding that these trends, especially for charge, are not quite as predictable as we'd like them to be. Okay. All right. Um, the possible charges on copper. Oh, let's do copper. Boy, uh, copper is argon, 4s2, 3d9. Okay. So let's do the uh, uh, configuration for copper. We would see. Um, I was showing the, the orbital diagram. The 4s has a pair in it, and the d has nine electrons in it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Boy, it's painfully close to being completely full, isn't it? Isn't it just just a tiny bit away? Well, this is what copper ends up doing. First of all, loses those s's right one one right after another. So copper we would expect to be two plus, and it definitely is. In fact, most of the time that's how we find copper. But another thing that copper does once in a while is it can be 1 plus, and that takes a little bit of explaining. Since it's so painfully close to having a full D sublevel, what if one of these 4s electrons in the outer level moved over and filled in that D sublevel? Then it would only have one to lose, and that's what happens. So copper tends to be 2 plus or 1 plus. Those are its possible charges. Now. Since we did that for copper, 2 plus or 1 plus, wouldn't you expect to see the same for silver? You'd expect that, wouldn't you? Well, let's take a look at silver. An exception when determining electron configurations is our friend silver. The configuration of silver is uh, krypton. We're going to put krypton in brackets here. And then we're going to go 5s2, 4d9. So if I did the orbital diagram, 5s with a pair, and then my 4d has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, once again painfully close to being completely full. Unlike copper, where it does it once in a while, silver does it all the time. That guy jumps over here to fill that up. So now how many electrons can silver lose? Only one. So silver tends to be positive 1. In fact, it doesn't tend to be. It's only ionic charge is positive 1. That's what always happens, and that's what really happens. So on my periodic table by silver, I'm going to put positive 1 to remind me of the fact that when it forms a charged particle, an ion, it's always positive 1. Okay, some little helps that we're filling in on our periodic table that we'll be using later. Okay, a couple of other quick items that I want to discuss with regards to periodic properties. The next is ionization energy. Now, we have already talked about this a little bit in class. Remember we talked about the alkali metals and did a demonstration when they react in water and how it becomes easier to lose that outer electron. And so as we went down the alkali metal family, they became more reactive with water because that electron became easier and easier to remove. Well, ionization energy is the energy needed. So it's an endothermic process, kiddos. We're always going to need energy here to remove an electron from a neutral atom. Now we're also going to run into second ionization energies, and second ionization energies would be, would be the energy needed to remove an electron from a positive one ion. Now let's take a look at this graph here. You notice, when I look at the noble gas family, they have super high ionization energies. That should be for obvious reasons. They have a nice stable octet. They're not going to be reactive. They're also the smallest members in their period. Remember when you go across the period, the atomic radius gets smaller? 
So it turns out, if those electrons are closer to the nucleus, it's harder to get them away. It's harder to remove them, because as we go across a period, the atomic radius gets smaller, so the ionization energy would increase. So that's why the noble gases are always at the peak in my graph. My y-axis is ionization energy, my x is going to be atomic number. You'll notice when I go um, down the alkali metal family, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, their ionization energy generally gets lower. Hmm, why would it get lower? Well, let's see, when I go down a family, the atomic radius is getting bigger, isn't it? And so as the atomic radius gets bigger, those electrons are farther and farther away from the nucleus. There's more shielding, and they're easier to pluck away. So the trend is this. When you go across a period, ionization energy increases because the atomic radius gets smaller. When you go down a family, the ionization energy decreases because um, you are gaining energy levels and there's more shielding and it becomes easier to pluck away that electron. So, there's actually four factors uh, that are involved um, in the ionization energy. Uh, number one is the energy level that the electron is being taken away from, and that's pretty doggone important. Number two is the sublevel that's being taken from. Number three is the amount of shielding, and maybe I should have put that as number two, but that's okay. And number four, I'm going to write paired electron versus unpaired. Ah, let's see. Then we had orbitals. Let's take the p orbital, for instance. Let's say we have three p electrons. None of them are paired up, right? So um, it's going to be, you know, take a certain amount of energy to pull away one of these electrons. I'm not sure which one would we be able to take away. They all have the same energy. But what if I had four electrons in that p sublevel? Guess which one of those electrons I would remove? It'd be one of these two, wouldn't it? Why would it be one of these two? Well, it tends to be easier to take away an electron from a pair than it does an electron from uh, an electron being removed from an unpaired orbital. These two guys are repelling each other a little bit, and so they're in a sense one of them is pushing the other out, decreasing the uh, the ionization energy by just a touch. So that's what I mean by paired versus unpaired. The big one that we really care about and we're going to focus on this year is going to be the energy level. We're, we'll worry about the others next year in AP. Okay, and when I say the energy level, I'm going to put in parentheses here the radius of the atom. Remember, as the radius gets smaller, it's harder to take away electrons. And so that means ionization energy would be higher. So when you go across the period, ionization energy increases. And when you go up a group, ionization energy increases. In both cases, the radius gets smaller. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of um, interesting situations. Uh, let's take a look at the first ionization energy for sodium. It takes about 496 uh, kilojoules of energy to remove one mole of electrons from a mole of sodium atoms. The second ionization energy is huge. Why would the second ionization energy be so much higher than the first? Let's take a look at our periodic table. Sodium has 11 electrons. Ask yourself, is it stable? Nope, it's not. It wants to have 10, doesn't it? So it loses one. It loses that one from the third energy level, right? So why is the second ionization energy so high? Well, let's start with the first. The first electron comes from the third energy level, doesn't it? What if I wanted to take away two electrons from sodium? Right? So the first one comes from the third energy level. Now I only have ten electrons, right? So where would that tenth electron come from? It would come from the second energy level, wouldn't it? So the second electron would have to come from a lower energy level. Oh, my spelling's not great there. Which, of course, is closer to the nucleus. It would make it more difficult to remove. You notice magnesium. It's 
first ionization energy isn't too bad. The second ionization energy isn't too bad. But the third is really, really high. Magnesium has 12 electrons. They can lose one pretty easily. It can lose the second pretty easily because they're both coming from the third energy level. But the third electron would have to come from the second energy level, which is much closer to the nucleus. And you shouldn't be surprised as to why aluminum would have such a high fourth ionization energy. You can lose one, two, and three pretty easily, but that fourth one would have to come from a lower energy level. Now, this chart right here for this year, we're going to skip. So don't worry about this one right here where it talks about a couple of glitches that we see. And that deals with pairing um, and how it becomes a little bit easier to take away an electron from a paired orbital than it is when it's by itself. So don't worry about that for right now. Last periodic property is electron affinity. I'm going to have you do most of that on your own. I'm going to define it for you quickly. We're going a bit longer on this video than we normally do, so I'm sort of rushing it a little bit. don't want to give you too much to watch tonight. But electron affinity is the attraction an atom has Oops, has for a non-bonding electron. That's a pretty simple definition actually for electron affinity, but it's the attraction an atom has, a neutral atom has, for a non-bonding electron. And just like ionization energy, the electron affinity increases when you go across the period. Once again, atoms get smaller, so it becomes easier for them to attract negative electrons to their nuclei, because they're closer to the nucleus. And when you go up a group, electron affinity increases just like ionization energy. Once again, because the radius gets smaller, it becomes easier for electrons to be attracted to the nucleus, because it's closer to the nucleus. Okay? I won't ask you too much about electron affinity. Alrighty, kiddos, we're finished up with periodic properties. We get to start bonding next. And that happens to be one of my most favorite units to teach. So we'll do molecular shape, we'll do bond angle, polarity, all sorts of fun things with this chapter coming up. I think you'll enjoy it. So have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.